Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener. And thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 5th, and we have 43 more days until spring. Today, we celebrate a botanist and an orchidologist who also saved Q. And we learn about an orchid hunter today who collected plants on behalf of the London Horticultural Society. We'll hear some words about the challenging experience of a botanist back in 1874. And we grow that garden library today with a book about one of America's earliest botanists. And he was also the father of America's first female botanist. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a plant that Joseph Dalton Hooker described as the ugliest yet most botanically magnificent plant in the world. Well, before we get to all of that, I just want to encourage you to head on over to the Daily Gardener website when you get a chance. You'll find it at thedailygardener.org. You'll be able to see all of the botanical history and literature posts from the podcast there. You can look through all of that. And then while you're there, you can also sign up for the free Friday newsletter. Every Friday, you'll get a letter from me in your email, and it will just contain some botanical history and literature to help tide you over during the weekend, along with some garden-related items for your calendar, garden gift ideas, recipes, and so forth. Finally, if you want to send any of your garden pictures or stories or birthday wishes, you can send them to me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. Now, for today's curated news, I found a wonderful little post on the carnation, and it was in a website that's called Harvesting History, and they share some little history tidbits about the carnation in addition to some really fun little growing instructions. What I liked is this little quote that they had from Joseph Breck. It was in his 1851 book called The Flower Garden. And Joseph proclaimed that there was no flower more desirable than the carnation. And then they go on to talk about how they describe propagation back then. And here's what they said. The propagation of the carnation by layers is very simple. When the plant is in bloom, lay around it one and a half to two inches of compost, first gently stirring the surface so that it may combine, remove the lower layers of the leaves of the shoots that are selected, and then pass a pen knife slanting upwards halfway through the joint. Fasten the shoot where it was cut about two inches under the surface. You stick it under a rock or something so that you don't break the incision and then firmly press the earth around it. And that's it. And in about six weeks, you will have a new plant, a new carnation plant that was established. So anyway, wonderful article here by Harvesting History. And I love their subtitle. It's called Seeding the Future. Great, great post, great fun little website to look through. Now, if you want to check out this post or the website for yourself, you can do it very easily over in the free Facebook community for the show. This is for the listeners of the Daily Gardener podcast. When you're in that Facebook group, all you need to do is type in the word carnation and this post will pop right up so you don't have to track anything down. It's all there, nicely curated for you. Now, if you are not in the group and you want to join, all you need to do is head on up to the search bar the next time you're on Facebook. Just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the British botanist, pomologist, pioneer orchidologist, and flower show organizer, John Lindley. He was born on this day, February 5th in 1799. John's dad was a nurseryman, and he ran a commercial nursery in England. And despite his array of botanical talents and knowledge, the family was always under financial duress. 
So growing up in his father's nursery, John always helped him, and he acquired the knowledge from growing up with his dad to land his first job as a seed merchant. This position led to a chain of events that would eventually shape John's life. First, he met the botanist William Jackson Hooker. That was fortuitous. And then second, Hooker introduced him to Sir Joseph Banks. And as a result of these connections, John ended up working as an assistant in Banks Herbarium. In 1838, after Banks died, when the fate of Kew Gardens hung in the balance, John recommended that the gardens belonged to the people and that they should become the botanical headquarters for England. Well, the government rejected John's proposal and they decided to close the garden. But on February 11th, 1840, John ingeniously demanded that the issue be put before the Parliament, and his advocacy brought the matter to the people. Well, the garden-loving public was not about to lose the Royal Botanic, and so John saved Kew Gardens, and William Hooker was chosen as the new director. From his humble beginnings to his incredible standing in English botanical history, John is remembered fondly for so many accomplishments. For 43 years, John served as the secretary to the Royal Horticultural Society, which is why today the RHS Library is called the Lindley Library. And there are over 200 plant species named for John Lindley. There's Lindleyi, Lindleyana, Lindleya, and Lindleyoides, just to name a few. And they all pay homage to John. And John once told his friend, the botanist Ludwig Reichenbach, I am a dandy in my herbarium. John loved plants. But without question, John's favorite plants were orchids. Before John, not much was known about orchids. But thanks to John, the genus Orchidaceae was shortened to orchid, which is much more friendly to pronounce. And when he died, John's massive orchid collection was moved to a new home at Kew the home he fought to save. John's friend, the botanist Ludwig Reichenbach, wrote a touching tribute after John died. That was rather fitting. He wrote, We cannot tell how long botany, how long science will be pursued, but we may affirm that so long as knowledge of plants is considered necessary, so long will Lindley's name be remembered with gratitude. And here's a little remembered factoid about John. He was blind in one eye. And it was on this day, February 5th in 1848, that the botanist Carl Theodore Hartwig boarded a Hawaiian ship on his way back to England. The London Horticultural Society had hired Carl to collect plants in California. Yet, when he reached London, the Hort Society was a little frustrated with Carl because he hadn't secured something they really wanted, the Bristol Cone Fir Seeds. Well, a short while later, Carl severed ties with London and he ended up in the south of Frankfurt, tending gardens for the Duke of Baden for 30 years until he died there in 1871. Carl's journey as a plant collector began in the Botanical Garden in Paris after working for the Chiswick Garden in London. And that's when Carl began to turn his attention to plant exploration. Eager to travel and explore, Carl left for America in 1836. 
And although Carl was only supposed to stay for a three-year project, he actually ended up staying for over seven years. And during the early to mid-1800s, native plants from Mexico, like dahlias and cacti, were all the rage. And as for Carl, he became a noted orchid hunter. This is probably why he didn't get a chance to get the Bristol Cone fir seeds that the Hort Society was so desperate for. And according to Merle Reinke, the author of A History of the Orchid, Carl's work was significant, and he contributed the most variable and comprehensive collection of New World orchids made by a single individual in the first half of the 19th century. And as a man of the world, Carl himself once dryly remarked as he was on one of his plant explorations, all the way from London, just to look after weeds. (laughs) I love that. In unearthed words, today's words are from Anita Sylvie, She's the author of the children's book, The Plant Hunters, and this is from her chapter called Bringing Themselves Home Alive. In 1874, the English botanist W.E.P. Giles, William Ernest Powell Giles, explored the vast deserts of central Australia Setting out with his hunting partner from a base camp at Fort McKellar, he discovered a leak in one of his large water bags. The two men decided to continue, even though the temperature had already climbed to 96 degrees Fahrenheit. Camping that night, they hung their remaining bags of water in a tree to protect them. But one of their horses attacked a bag with her teeth, spraying the water all over the ground. And now neither the men nor the animals had enough water. The realities of plant collecting in the 1800s. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Cadwallader Colden by Seymour Schwartz. This book came out in 2013, and the subtitle is A Biography. In this book, Seymour gives us the first complete biography of the American botanist Cadwallader Colden. Cadwallader was the longest-serving lieutenant governor of New York, and he was incredibly intelligent and multi-talented, a true Renaissance man, of America's colonial times. A trained physician, Cadwallader improved public health, and he wrote the very first scientific paper published in the colonies, as well as the first map of New York. Cadwallader was also the father of America's first female botanist, his daughter, Jane Colden. This book is 230 pages of the life of a colonial Renaissance man, Cadwallader Colden. It's a fantastic book. You can get a copy of Cadwallader Colden by Seymour Schwartz and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $4. Now that's a steal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the birthday of the Austrian botanist and explorer Friedrich Wellwich, who was born on this day, February 5th in 1806. Friedrich found a second home in the country of Portugal, where he served as the director of the Botanic Gardens in Lisbon. Friedrich had some fantastic experiences during his lifetime, But the pinnacle was clearly the day that he discovered the Wellwichia mirabilis. The mirabilis refers to its unusual form. Now, Portugal had sent Friedrich to Africa to collect plants 
which he did for seven years. In 1860, Friedrich discovered a strange looking plant. It's actually a tree, a conifer, and a gymnosperm in terms of botanical classification. The Africans called it Mr. Big. Now, the Welwitchia is endemic to Namibian deserts, and it's also present on their coat of arms. When Friedrich discovered this unique plant, which can live for more than 1,500 years and bears only two leaves in its entire life cycle, he was so astonished that he, quote, could do nothing but kneel down and gaze at it, half in fear, lest a touch should prove it a figment of the imagination. Imagine a two-tentacled octopus with very long arms and a red floral bouquet for a head, and you have the Welwitchia mirabilis. Welwitchia's two leaves grow continuously throughout the life of the plant. The pair of leaves are broad and leathery and belt-shaped, and incredibly, some specimens tested with carbon-14 are over 2,000 years old. And there's a spectacular photo of Friedrich online. If you look him up, you'll see it. He's seated behind a large Welwitchia mirabilis. Friedrich is sitting there wearing a pith helmet, and the plant's leaves are clearly many times longer than Friedrich's arms and legs, which are mostly obscured by the plant. But it's a fantastic picture, and I printed off a copy for myself, and I have it in my own botanical library back at home because I see it as a hallmark picture, a milestone picture in the plant exploration of the 1800s. It's quite the photo. And in 1862, when Joseph Dalton Hooker described the Welwitchia mirabilis in the Gardener's Chronicle, he said that it was the ugliest, yet the most botanically magnificent plant in the world. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending another week with The Daily Gardener. If you worry you'll miss your daily dose of botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter where I'm at Gardener Podcast and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and leave a review for the show over at Podchaser. I so appreciate reviews. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you on Monday.